ask members to take their places. We must move on to questions to the Minister for Communities. Can I ask members to take their places? And we're moving on to questions to the Minister for Communities. Um, questions 4, 6 and 9 have been withdrawn. I call Alec Atwood. And question number one. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, my department is still uh, working on setting the affordable homes target for the 2017-18 financial year. However, uh, I can indicate that it's likely to be similar to the current year's target. The target for affordable housing this year is 750 homes. Uh, this target includes a mix of new build and existing market homes. I call Alec Ashwood for a supplementary. Uh, could I also then therefore ask the Minister what uh, his likely target for the 17-18 financial year is in respect of new build social housing and has there been any indication from London Treasury of any consequentials arising from the announcements of the Tory party conference last week where there was indications that new funding would be made available for social and affordable housing? I, I can Tell the House that next year the figure is uh, 1,600 for social homes is what we're aiming to build in respect of the announcements from the Conservative Party conference, not a conference that I follow extensively. Uh, and so I'm, I'm, not aware, I'm not aware of uh, anything that's going to be consequential in terms of the, the outworkings of that. However, I'll be happy to look into that issue. I call Andy Allen. Can I ask the Minister if he's got the figures as to how many of those new bills will be for East Belfast and indeed if he's content that the level of new bills will help to alleviate the housing crisis we're, we're embarking upon here? No, I don't have the figures in specific to East Belfast uh, around what the current target is for those 750 homes this year and how that's being ruled out. Happy to try and provide the specific answers to the member in respect of that. But obviously it's uh, critically important that we try and uh, afford people an opportunity to get on the housing market and so what this executive has been able to do uh, is to allocate funding in terms of uh, the financial uh, capital transaction monies uh, and that has allowed us to put in 130 million pounds uh, which is going to be used uh, to support the provision of over three and a half thousand new homes over uh, coming years and that's something that i think uh, this house can welcome i call gordon dunn thank you mr sorry thank you madam principal speaker and thank the Minister for his answers. Can the Minister uh, advise us of any initiatives that his department has taken to help especially young people get on the property ladder and get access to a new home? I well, thank the member for the question. Uh, obviously, this is a, an important scheme for us in terms of affordable uh, homes so that we can secure more people that opportunity to get on the, the housing ladder. Uh, and so beyond the, the, the monies allocated around the co-ownership, obviously, uh, we're also uh, developing a scheme around the Affordable Homes Loan Fund, and that was launched back in March 2014. And uh, initially, there had uh, been some reticence from financial institutions to support what was called the fair share product. Uh, but, however, three major lenders, uh, the Nationwide, Lloyds and Santander, uh, have now all signed up to support that product and housing associations are finalising the administration arrangements for the new product. And that again will be another scheme in which uh, it should be able to help people an opportunity to get a home which they need. Aaron, sir, Fran McCann. I call Fran McCann. Uh, has the Minister taken into consideration the many adults with learning disability? Uh, who are currently living with aging parents and need appropriate support or independent housing? Well, this, this is a, a vitally important issue, one that I've met a number of people on, and we all can uh, bear testimony in our own constituencies, people who come to us with uh, needs around housing related to disabilities. Uh, and so this is something that I have a particular interest in. Um, and in terms of obviously people who are in homes with parents and providing care, that, that's something that I want to take forward in terms of the way in which the processes are operating or in my view in some cases uh, have failed and I want to ensure that we have fit for purpose processes so that people who are faced with difficult circumstances when it comes to housing get the support that they need to get in a timely manner. I call Paula Bradshaw. Principal Deputy Speaker, can I ask the Minister, in terms of this new um, social bill you, you referred to there, how many are for um, how many are in shared housing schemes? Well, obviously, there's shared housing programmes that the executive has identified um, and that are to be taken forward. But let me be clear: housing is allocated on the basis of need, 
Uh, and when it comes to people who are allocated housing, uh, I don't believe it should be on the basis of one's religion. It should be on the basis of the need that has to be met. Uh, and therefore, uh, I know in some constituencies you get housing developments where you're able to provide a shared housing uh, model uh, because of the nature uh, of the, the housing waiting list that you're drawing from. Uh, but that isn't always available and it isn't always possible to achieve that. And uh, indeed, uh, I don't believe that you should be uh, artificially trying to manufacture circumstances where people are denied a house on the basis of the religion in order to reach a specific target around shared housing. I call Paul Frew. Question number two. Well, the, I'm pleased to advise that uh, my department is progressing plans to redevelop uh, the former military site that was declared surplus uh, by Defence Estates in 2007. Following the purchase of the site last year, my department appointed consultants to commence the initial surveys and assessments required for the outline planning application. Uh, the preferred development option to fully develop the 36-acre uh, 36 site was endorsed by the Mid and East Antrim Borough Council in July and will be subject to a formal public consultation which will commence in November. In the interim, uh, I have already had uh, a meeting with the Council Chief Executive and the Mayor uh, in recent weeks and uh, I intend to follow that up and visit the site. Uh, the outline planning application will be submitted following the public consultation. Paul Frew for a supplement. I thank the Minister for his answer. Uh, St Patrick's Barracks has a rich military history, as does the town of, of Bellamina. Will the department protect the, the identity and the legacy of St Patrick's Barracks site uh, in the new redevelopment? Well, the, the member will be uh, very familiar, I know, with the site and his uh, constituency, uh, and he is right to highlight the, the rich heritage uh, that exists there. Uh, the preferred development option for the site seeks to retain a number of existing buildings, uh, albeit for new purposes. Uh, suggested retained buildings include the Guardhouse, Sandhurst uh, Building and the Water Tower, amongst some others. Final decisions in respect of retention and their use will be made um, after the public consultation and may de be dependent on planning and structural surveys and their viability. Call Robin Swan. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his update. Can the Minister advise just what budget allocation he set aside for the preferred option that he's talking about and what sort of time frame there is? There is to that, and can also push him maybe if he could look at retaining the gates to the barracks as well. Well, the, on the latter point, I know that was an issue I think that was discussed um, with the, the council chief executive. But in respect of the this precise costs to develop the site, uh, there will be an economic appraisal that's being carried out by the project's planning and transport consultants, and that will identify the costs that will be required to develop this site, uh, but obviously it's a, a, an important site for the North Antrim constituency and Ballymena in particular, uh, particularly in light of uh, some of the unemployment that has been announced um, with significant uh, closures of uh, some of the factories. And so I recognise the significance of this site. Um, I've received representation not just from Mr Swan but from my own uh, constituency colleagues and the Member of Parliament for the area about the need to really push on with this de development. Uh, and so uh, that's why I want to go on site um, so that I can meet with the relevant stakeholders, identify what the key plans are for it and then push on. And if that means trying to identify additional resources to do that, then that's something that I want to seek to deliver on. Aaron, sir, Philip McGuigan. I call Philip McGuigan. Thank you, uh, Madam Deputy Principal Speaker. And can I thank the Minister for his answers thus far? And given that he has uh, outlined the importance of the site and a number of possible proposals, can I ask the Minister if he intends to use this site for much needed social housing in the Ballymena area and also for other much needed community regeneration purposes? Well, in respect of the, the housing, uh, based on the current preferred development option, there have been 140 uh, units identified uh, to allow housing to be developed on the site. Um, but I, I'm, I'm keen that we do that, um, but I'm keen to make sure that we can attract industry onto the site, that you get the right type of industry, uh, so that that can create uh, the jobs that is needed in the, the Ballymena area. I call Jim Allister. Mr. I understand it's over eight years since the barracks closed. It's over five years since it was transferred to the executive. Can I understand the level of impatience locally at the failure to progress this matter to the point of real decisions? Uh, and 
Now, now Has the member a question? Now we're facing a further consultation. Could, could the uh, member so come what, to his question, please? What hope is there of bringing this to fruition? And can he tell us, is there any contamination issue on any part of the site? Well, I can certainly understand the frustration that the member has highlighted. Um, obviously, I'm in this post four months now, or five months, um, and I'm keen to make sure that we can really push on with this development. I know uh, Mid and East Antrim Borough Council have only recently been put on as a key stakeholder, uh, and I know that they have brought uh, strong representation as to the need to really drive on with this. And, um, when I met with the Chief Executive of the Council uh, and the Mayor, that point was made very strongly. that. Uh, they have a very clear vision that they want to develop the site and that the Council uh, would want to play their part in doing that. Uh, and so I think that together we can push on with this development. Um, I'll come back to the member in respect of the issue around contamination. I call Mike Nesbitt. Question three. The Urban Development Grant Programme is an important tool in the Department's toolbox for regenerating our towns and cities, encouraging private inward investment, job creation and environmental improvement to derelict, vacant or underused sites in priority areas. Uh, my Department reopened the programme on the 4th of April uh, this, uh, 2016 with a call for new applications. Uh, 147 applications were received within the six-week timescale. All of these have been assessed against my department's strategic priorities, existing regeneration plans and the scheme's intended outputs. The standard of applications and proposals uh, was exceptionally high. 19 applications were taken forward to the next stage where they are being subjected to a full economic appraisal to determine if there is a sufficiently robust business case to make a grant offer. Should these projects uh, satisfy successfully the costs and benefits that are assessed, in the economic appraisal process, they could lead to over £60 million of new private sector investments being directed into the heart of our towns and cities. 20 applications did not meet the minimum standards and they were rejected. The remaining 108 applications were all determined to be of merit, but unfortunately the level of applications exceeded uh, the available budget. The available budget allocation for this year is £700,000 and this reflects what is deliverable during the remainder of this year. I am currently examining the budget proposals for the remainder of the mandate, therefore it is too early uh, to give a figure for funding in future years. However, I can assure the member that funding is being sought that is commensurate with the importance uh, of this programme and the regeneration of our towns and cities. Mike Nesbitt for a supplement. Uh, I thank the Minister. will be aware that the Argyle Business Centre uh, wanted to develop the Shankill Mission into a four-star hotel. Uh, their application was turned down initially, uh, one of your officials said, because it was not of strategic merit, and yet they scored 14 out of 15 in the matrix with two perfect fives uh, on strategic uh, fit. Uh, and the issue in the second letter from the same official said, no, you're being turned down Has because the member of the a question? of funding. Could the member come to his question, please? Can he confirm that 14 out of 15 was the top score, and can he tell us why the Argyle Business Centre has been denied? Well, the, the level of detail that the member is aware of that particular uh, application uh, isn't the level of detail that I have for all of the 147 applications that were submitted. Um, obviously, there's a process, there's a criteria, um, and it would be inappropriate for me as a minister to be intervening and changing that criteria. In respect of the, the particular example that the, the member raises, um, it, it has been relayed to me that the application did have merit. Um, but the department uh, that was uh, officials that were dealing with it deemed that it is not to be a viable project due to the high levels of public funding that's required, which were deemed to breach state aid rules. Uh, the applicant was contacted in writing, spoken to by the department's officials and advised of this. Uh, I know there was a comparator uh, provided uh, in respect to a similar cocktail of funding that was allowed in Londonderry for Bishop's Gate Hotel. Uh, the Bishop's Gate Hotel was funded under the previous Urban Development Grant funding programme. Uh, at that time, the North West Development Office didn't classify lottery funding as state uh, resources and considered it to be private funding. However, an audit report in 2014 recommended that new guidance should be developed as there was an inconsistent approach to the assessment, analysis and award of this type of funding. And when the scheme reopened, the new guidance was developed and it clarified that lottery funding was, uh, as lottery funding was controlled by the state, it should be classified as state resources. I call Christopher Stalford. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Principal Deputy Speaker, whilst the Minister cannot 
comment on an individual case. Could the Minister outline for the House against which criteria applicants to the scheme are assessed? Well, the, the key strategic areas in which applications were considered um, had three main areas. How well it complied with the Department's strategic vision for regeneration as set out in its urban regeneration and community development policy framework, whether the project was located within a priority area such as a town centre or neighbourhood renewal area, and the outputs that the project would generate uh, that would contribute to the regeneration of the area. Uh, project outputs include such criteria as the ratio of private sector investment to public sector investment the number of jobs that the project will create, its impact on the construction industry and the amount of rateable floor, uh, place, uh, floor space that it creates. Um, that's a highlight of some of them, but it's by no means an exhaustive list. Aram, sir, Declan McAleer. I call Declan McAleer. Uh, can the Minister, would the Minister like to comment on what uh, similar level of support may be available for our smaller regional towns? Well, th this was applicable to all of the towns in which the threshold is met for my department, uh, Madam Principal Deputy Speaker, which is uh, over 5,000. When it comes to villages that are under 5,000, uh, the regeneration plans for that falls uh, within the responsibility of uh, the Department for Agriculture, Rural Affairs and the Environment. Um, but obviously, uh, this type of scheme is one which has been proven to be very uh, successful. Uh, it is one that we weren't able to provide funding to in the recent uh, past. However, we've been able to find some funding this year to get it opened, and I'm keen that we uh, would uh, increase the budget that's available in future years, subject to the outworkings of that process, because I recognise that it can help regenerate areas uh, which are in need of that um, regeneration. I call Stuart Dixon. Thank you, uh, Principal Deputy Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Minister, can you indicate to the House um, what positive conditions are attached to urban development grant that ensure that these schemes uh, seek and draw together uh, open, uh, open and shared spaces? I missed the, was it Irish open? Sorry. The question, Minister, is what guarantee can you give that these schemes uh, attract uh, shared space uh, or shared and open space when it comes to delivery of the grant? Yes, sorry, apologies for not uh, picking the member up clearly at the start. In respect of all of these grants that are being put in, uh, the main objective for this is to regenerate an area uh, in order to make it more welcome for people to come in to provide uh, those opportunities for businesses to develop. Uh, that's on the basis of being open and accessible to everybody in our society. I call Harold McKee. Question number five. Madam Deputy Speaker, just with um, your approval, I was grouping this one with question eight as well. Um, the Musical Instruments for Bands programme is designed to increase the quality of music making in the community by helping bands to replace worn out instruments and purchase new instruments. The scheme is open to bands based in Northern Ireland, which are formally constituted. In the current financial year, um, £200,000 has been allocated by my department to the Arts Council for Northern Ireland to fund musical instruments for bands programme. Grants range in the scale from £500 to £5,000. The scheme opened for applications on the 21st of July. The Arts Council has advised that 94 applications were received before the closing date of the 15th of September and that these applications are currently being eligibility checked. All eligible applications will then proceed to assessment. Decisions are due at the end of October. Uh, applications will be assessed on the following criteria, artistic quality, public benefit and project management. Regarding the future of the programme, I intend to establish a steering group to conduct a review of the musical instruments for bands policy. The purpose of the review will be to co-design a more fit-for-purpose musical instruments for bands scheme and make recommendations for improvements or modifications which would maximise its impact and improve engagement with young males who are currently underrepresented in cultural participation. Harold McKee for a supplementary. Thank you, Minister, for your answer this far. Can the Minister advise what monies have been allocated to bands in South Down from this fund? Well, at this stage, um, Madam Principal Deputy Speaker, I'm not in a position to obviously announce those bands that have been successful. Uh, 
what I indicated in the initial answer was that uh, there were 94 applications have been made. Uh, once they are eligibility checked, uh, then there will be a breakdown provided in respect of uh, those bands that have been successful, and then members will be able to see if their own constituency has benefited from it. Trevor Clark, for a supplementary. So, thank you very much, uh, Principal Deputy Speaker. I'm sure uh, the Minister will agree that there's many bands were disappointed previously when this funding was cut, and can I congratulate the Minister on reinstating that? However, in his answer, he said there were 94 bands have made applications, and after the eligibility checks are carried out, I appreciate we don't know how many there will be there. Has the member a but, question? But given there is a chance that it could be oversubscribed, what's the possibility of in year adding additional funding to this programme? Well, Madam Principal, Deputy Speaker, uh, I very clearly wanted to re-establish this fund. Uh, I think the fact that 94 applications were made, uh, the highest number of applications that have been made to the fund uh, for quite a number of years, uh, demonstrates the popularity of the scheme, and uh, it was the right decision for me to do that. Uh, with the success of the uh, process and the fact that 94 applications were made, uh, should all 94 be deemed successful, uh, then it's estimated uh, that the, uh, the total budget required for that would actually be uh, closer to £300,000. So I'm pleased to advise the House that I'll be making that funding available if all of those applications are deemed to be successful. Aram, sir, Sean Lynch. I'm well, good uh, previous can call you. Does the Minister agree that funding will be offered to similar cultural organisations such as Kyoto's? Well, th this musical instruments uh, fund is available to all uh, marching bands who avail of musical instruments. So again, uh, there was no distinction drawn in terms of it being accessible to one community or the other. This was one that is opened uh, to everyone to make an application to. Here, sir, Nicola Mellon. I call Nicola Mellon. Thank you, Madam Deputy uh, Principal Speaker. Um, can I ask the Minister, is he content that there is a diversity of traditions in the 94 applications received to date? Well, given the publicity that surrounded this, I certainly went out of my way to uh, try and, and demonstrate that this was a fund that had been brought back into existence uh, to give it as uh, wide a public airing as possible. Uh, and therefore, all of those who are engaged in terms of uh, marching bands and musical instruments uh, should have been aware. Given the, the highest number of applicants that uh, have made a request to this fund, I think demonstrates how widely known that it is. Um, but I can assure the House I haven't looked at where these applications have came from. Uh, I'm not remotely interested in terms of the religious breakdown of them. If people are, again, have a need to be met, uh, whether they're from a more Protestant tradition of musical instruments or a Catholic tradition, then they should be uh, able to access this funding, uh, and certainly they, all people had the opportunity to do so. I call Gary Middleton. Question number seven, Principal Deputy Speaker. The number of persons convicted for benefit fraud through the courts was 453 in 2013-14, 294 in 2014-15, and 272 in 2015-16. In addition, administrative penalties were imposed on 657, 447 and 659 individuals in each of the respective years. Gary Middleton for supplementary. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker, and can I thank the Minister for his response. Uh, can the Minister outline what he is doing to prevent uh, the payments of benefits to prisoners? Thank you. Uh, thank the member for that. It's a question that a number of members have raised um, in previous question times. Uh, the Department has a very proactive and detailed process to prevent prisoner payments. This includes the sharing of prisoner committal and release data twice weekly with the Northern Ireland Prison Service. Important to recognise the complexity of benefit rules. Staff must assess and apply the rules of each benefit on a case-by-case -case, uh, basis. Where possible and within the law, recovery of any overpayments are pursued. And I've asked officials to uh, explore the scope for building on our current processes, particularly the potential for increasing the flow of data from point of committal to the point of benefit adjust uh, adjustment. I call Aaron Sir Mark Durkin. I call Mark Durkin. Good morning, Mr. Free. Would you ask John Collier on, on the subject of, of benefit fraud? Would the minister be in a position to tell the House how much money has been lost uh, over the past year through benefit fraud, and how much has been lost through error? Minister. Well, in respect of the, the levels of uh, benefit fraud across the social security. Um, 
benefits, excluding housing benefit. Uh, it was 0.6% of benefit expenditure in 2015. That equates to 28.3 uh, million. Um, th that represents a significant improvement um, with benefit fraud having been in 2001, uh, 2002, equating to 2% of expenditure, which would have been 94 million uh, in today's terms. So the current low levels of benefit fraud have been sustained for a number of years as a result of my department's robust strategy for tackling fraud uh, and error. Aram, sir, Michelle Gildren, you are called Michelle Gildren, you. Garmin uh, Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, could the Minister give an assessment of the current resource dedicated uh, within his department to the issue of benefit fraud? Well, the department invests around £13 million per year across its social security benefit fraud and error operation. Uh, that investment provides for a team of almost 400 people directly involved in activity ranging from accuracy checks to prevent staff error to criminal investigations where customer fraud is suspected. Current levels of investment have resulted in a level of loss through customer fraud and error of just 1% uh, of expenditure. That compares to 3% uh, in 2001 02 and represents a current annual saving each year of £100 million in today's terms. I call Rosemary Barton. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Can the Minister advise how many of those convicted have set up an arrangement to pay the money back? Uh, I think I will need to provide the member with specific detail in respect of that, um, and I'll come back to the member. I call Kelly Armstrong. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, Fresh Start agreed that half of the savings from the error and fraud initiative implemented by the executive um, will be reinvested by the executive instead of the Treasury. To ask the Minister then, to what projects has this money, money been allocated? Well, in respect of what was identified in Fresh Start, um, obviously we first of all need to secure the funding from Treasury, um, and that is something where discussions are continuing uh, with Her Majesty's Treasury on an invest to save uh, proposal, and that's something that I've been pushing within the Department to expedite. I call Mr. Tom Buchanan. Question number 10, uh, Deputy Speaker. The performance of our Paralympians in Rio shows how people with a disability can participate in sport right up to elite level. My department and Sport Northern Ireland recognise the importance of encouraging participation in sport by people with a disability. Uh, we have engaged with other executive departments and representatives from organisations from across the disability sector to increase opportunities and develop a long-term action plan to support participation in sport by people with a disability. And I'll be announcing further details on this in the near future, alongside funding to assist with uh, implementing the plan. A review of Sports Matters, the strategy for sport in 2015, recommended that sport and disability is recognised as a key priority throughout the next five years to achieve greater participation. The development of the action plan will play a major part in addressing this recommendation and its delivery over the coming years. Uh, my aim is that people with a disability will have an equal opportunity to access sport and active recreation, which will lead to a more healthy, fulfilling and active lifestyle. Buchanan for a supplementary. Thank the Minister for his response. But can the Minister inform the House as to what plans he has for capital investment into the disabled sport? In respect of the investment that uh, I would, are currently am putting in, uh, there's just over £2 million in Special Olympic Ulster uh, for a four-year uh, period. Uh, across the 11 district councils, uh, there has been uh, £2.4 million, pounds, again, uh, being spent to support uh, the Disability Sport NI and Special Olympics um, around this issue. And to reassure members of the House, uh, in terms of the programme uh, for Government Indicator, um, there is a very clear line that says improving the quality of life for people with disabilities and their families, and that is something that will ensure uh, that there will be prior prioritisation uh, given to this. Uh, also, there is £1 million uh, in respect of a four-year investment uh, will be provided in Disability Sports NI's new uh, strategic plan. I can also inform the member uh, that uh, in respect of uh, providing uh, support for disabled person's participation around volunteering. There's £1,200 for each successful applicant. Lifelong vol volunteering was uh, £175,000 provided in the past 
uh, year. And so this is obviously a key priority for me. Whenever you've got athletes uh, like Bethany Firth, who topped the league uh, for Team GB, uh, there's a clear recognition uh, that our Paralympians performed hugely successful, and uh, now is the right time to be trying to capitalise on that uh, success and encouraging more people to participate. I call Cahill Boylan for a brief supplementary. But, uh, just to follow on from that, could I ask the Minister how he's going to encourage more people from the rural areas to participate in the sport? Well, this is a, obviously there's been funding provided to all 11 district councils, and so our councils have a real opportunity to identify the type of sporting infrastructure that's needed uh, in their areas that they're responsible for. The community planning process pulls together all of the relevant organisations, and Sport NI uh, is part of that process. And so they're developing uh, concrete plans to identify the type of infrastructure that's needed. Uh, and that is something that I'll be wanting to support whenever we look at the capital budget over the next four years to provide the type of funding that I believe is needed. With the right uh, infrastructure in place, we can then encourage more people to get involved, uh, more people with disabilities, and as well, a priority for me is going to be getting more uh, girls involved in sport. Shinan Gerilish and I'm the Keshna Listolcha. That uh, ends the period for li listed questions. We will now move on to 15 minutes of topical questions. Iram Sir Mark Durkin. I call him Mark Durkin. I think a, a sad indictment of our social welfare system is the growing reliance on food banks. Could I ask the Minister what his department is doing to support the many food banks here in the north? Minister. Well, this is an issue that was uh, drawn very clearly to my attention when recently I uh, was visiting um, Coleraine Compassion Vineyard. Uh, and uh, that church has over 18 uh, projects that they're involved in trying to help people. Uh, and one of the key parts of those programs is the food bank that they uh, are involved in. And so they are able to identify individuals when they come in. Uh, the type of support that they need, uh, be able to signpost them to statutory organisations, but also uh, given the wide range of projects they're involved in. And, and so a lot of organisations, particularly um, in our uh, community and voluntary sector, have got involved in this. And so I want to ensure that the right support is being made available to those organisations uh, when it comes to tackling all of these issues that are very important to address. Mark Durkin for supplementary. I have a few last concola and, and I thank the Minister for his answer. Given, given all the work that the Department is doing allegedly to support the, the work of these vital food banks, does the Minister not find it strange that in response to a recent written question I tabled to him, he was unable to tell me how many food banks we have here in Northern Ireland? It, it isn't a case of uh, what this department is allegedly doing. This is something that I take incredibly serious. In terms of trying to help those most vulnerable in our society, that's something that all of us should be engaged on. Uh, and when it comes to these issues, I want to ensure that I'll do all that I can to support organisations that are out there in the community working alongside people. Uh, and so, very quickly, I've been out on the ground meeting with a, a huge range of uh, organisations that are tackling very difficult issues for these vulnerable people, uh, and I want to assure them that they have my support. Uh, and the voluntary community sector are heavily involved in a lot of this work, and so we have the concordat uh, that recognises officially the relationship between government and between the community and voluntary sector. That's something that we constantly look at, we constantly review to ensure that government is supporting uh, the community and voluntary sector in terms of the work that they're involved in. Uh, let me be clear, I want to reduce the number of people who find themselves in these situations where they're having to go to food banks uh, to get support, and that's something that I'll continue to seek and pursue. I call Danny Kennedy. Thank you. Uh, will the Minister join with me in, in expressing profound sympathy to the family, friends and colleagues of Drew Nelson following his untimely passing earlier today? And will he agree with me that the far-sighted and positive contribution made by Drew Nelson the most per particularly the orange order will be his lasting legacy. Yeah. Well, can I thank the, the member for raising this and giving me an opportunity uh, on the floor of the House to be able to pay my own tribute to Drew. Drew was a friend of mine, someone obviously in my constituency who uh, encouraged me and supported me in many ways. Um, but when I look over at the chamber and I see Mr Humphrey sitting beside Mr Kennedy, uh, that, that was typical of obviously what the Orange Fraternity can do. It brings people together. 
um, from whatever background that they, they are involved in in terms of the, the unionist uh, sphere of uh, politics. And uh, Drew had that foresight. Um, his legacy uh, is one that the Orange Order will benefit from for many, many years in terms of the vision that he had for the organisation, the way in which he navigated many issues through Grand Lodge uh, and was able to come forward with uh, programmes that were something that will be of huge benefit. And so, um, certainly, we join in remembering uh, the contribution that he's made. Uh, we particularly remember the family at this time, uh, offer them our prayerful support, um, and recognise the huge contribution he made to the Orange Order and to our community at large. Danny Kennedy for a supplementary. Thank you. Uh, will the Minister also ensure that there will be ongoing uh, positive engagement with the Orange Institution? in the future on both cultural and uh, community developments uh, as a lasting memorial to the work of Dream Lands. I am more than happy to, to give that assurance to the member um, in respect of uh, supporting the Orange Order and, and so much of the work that it carries out across our community. And whenever I see the number of uh, halls that exist, particularly in rural areas, and how they are accessed by uh, people of all religious persuasions and they avail of that uh, support that they get. And Drew Nelson was very much at the heart of taking forward the message about having the halls open, available, and they, they drive to get the investment put into the Orange Halls. He, he continually challenged uh, government about the need to support the infrastructure of the Orange Order for those type of halls and, of course, for government to recognise the valuable contribution that the Orange Order makes to our society. And the, the loss um, of uh, Drew Nelson to the Orange Order will be sorely missed by that organisation. Call Emma Little Pengelly. I'm sure the Minister would agree with me in recognising the valuable work that the churches and the faith community do in supporting and helping people to change their lives. I know that the Minister is currently considering and developing the social strategy for Northern Ireland. Can the Minister confirm that he will continue to engage with the faith and church community in the development of that strategy? I'm happy to give that assurance to the member. Um, she rightly points out the contribution uh, that the faith-based uh, organisations make uh, to our society. Uh, and that is something that I recognise and value, uh, and I have witnessed at first hand uh, those organisations um, in terms of the, the values that they have, the passion, the compassion, and that's something that we as government uh, need to support uh, and do more on. So within the draft social strategy that I've been developing, uh, we have engaged with all stakeholders represented in the Section 75 groups. That includes uh, the faith-based uh, organisations, and I'll bring that strategy uh, to the executive in coming weeks with the intention of having it issued, subject to executive approval as part of the new approach to the programme uh, for government. I call Emma little Pengelly for a supplementary. I know the Minister will be aware of the valuable work, even in my own constituency of South Belfast, around older people, uh, supporting young people, food banks, as already mentioned here today. Um, many of the, the churches and the faith community perhaps have, have been excluded for too long from input into consultations and development of social strategies Has the member and other a strategies. Can the Minister confirm that not only in the development of the social strategy, but he will commit to consulting with them much wider in the whole range of departmental policy responsibilities? Yes, that's something that I've already raised within the department about the need to have further engagement. And so we already now have an exercise taking place carried out by NICVA in terms of a mapping project so that we can clearly identify those faith-based organisations across the province and the type of work uh, that they're involved in. So through that consultation process, uh, I would want to develop a, a, a new way of doing business in, in that respect between government and faith-based organisations. And so uh, that engagement with the department, I intend then to take forward the development of a faith covenant uh, modelled on the principles of the concordat between the government and the voluntary and community sector, facilitating a valued and effective faith-based contribution to policy development and service delivery across government. Aram, sir, Declan Kearney. I call Declan Kearney. I got a free if you ask on Corlea. Uh, does the minister accept that the deplorable racist behaviour towards a Romanian woman in Antrim Town in my own constituency last week underlines the, the pressing urgency of ensuring full implementation of the racial equality strategy? 
Well, let me join with the member in, in condemning um, and stating very clearly how deplorable such attacks are. Whenever they happen, uh, they are rightly condemned, and they should be condemned because they are repugnant to us in our society. Uh, and so I very much agree with the member in respect of that. What I would say is that it's hugely important that government tackles all of these issues uh, and that we identify all of these vulnerable groups in Northern Ireland and we provide the support that is needed. And so uh, whether that's through strategies or whether it's through other processes, the, the same end aim uh, should be for all of us, and that is to try and eradicate that type of behaviour. Declan Kearney for supplementary. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. I appreciate your answer and that leads directly into my, my supplementary. Would you agree, Minister, that this Assembly must show collective united opposition to all forms of racism, sectarianism, homophobia, all forms of intolerance in our society, and to promote equality for all identities and traditions, including respect for the Irish language? Well, okay. Um, in respect of all of those issues, let, let me make it clear. Um, whatever tradition, whatever background, sexual orientation, uh, you should be protected in our society. Uh, and we should make accommodation for people. Uh, they need to be reasonable accommodations. And we need to find a way that we can navigate tensions that often exist. Because uh, what I certainly experience uh, and, and hear people tell me about that uh, there can be conflict at times between different sections of our society. And what we need to look at is a collective approach where we recognize we are one whole society, but within that there are differences of opinions. Um, but we need to find ways in which we can navigate all of that in a way that respects people uh, without compromising some people's views on people's different identity characteristics and stop using those different identity characteristics as a way to engage in, in often debates uh, where people end up feeling hurt uh, and offended from that. Um, but within a free society, people are entitled to free speech and, and to have their own opinions. But I want to create a society very much uh, where we recognise all of those different identity characteristics in a way that we can try and find space to recognise the differences that exist. I call Gordon Lyons. Thank you, Madam Principal Deputy Speaker. Can I thank the Minister uh, for his answer to the previous question? And further to that, would the Minister agree with me that attacks on churches, cultural centres, community halls, uh, places of, of worship, whatever they may be, are completely wrong? And um, Would he uh, send out a message from this uh, Assembly today that such things will not uh, be tolerated? Well, the member raises a, a very important point, and it's one that I intend to address uh, in the future uh, at a more appropriate occasion with something more specific. Uh, but certainly I have been hugely concerned by the attacks that have taken place uh, on a, a broad range of our faith-based uh, organisations. When I say attacks that have taken place against Orange Halls, attacks that have taken place against uh, places of worship, be they uh, Protestant churches, Catholic churches, when I say attacks uh, that took place to desecrate uh, the graveyards of those uh, Jewish people in our community, that is something that should cause us huge alarm uh, and rightly is something that should be condemned. Uh, and it's something that we need to recognise is happening uh, and then we need to address it and call out uh, those people who engage in such behaviour for what they are, people uh, who hate people who have different religious beliefs uh, to each other. So that, that is something that uh, certainly I recognise uh, is one that has caused me huge concern uh, and one that we as a society uh, need to address. I call Gordon Lyons for supplementary. Thank you, Madam Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answer. He mentions Orange Halls, and we are uh, all very aware um, of the, the numbers and the extent uh, of damage which has been done to Orange Halls over the last number of years. I welcome his commitment to uh, addressing this issue as, as well as issues um, with regards uh, to people of other faiths and, and other religions. Um, will the Minister send out a very strong message here today that any Orange Halls uh, that are attacked uh, will be uh, rebuilt and that um, there is no tolerance for those who are so intolerant in this way? Well, obviously, whenever we've witnessed attacks on halls, and, and recently um, we, we've been able to see in the media the opening, the reopening of Thiefel Memorial and Convoy in East Donegal, an attack that was rightly condemned by all of the political parties in that uh, part of uh, the Republic of Ireland, uh, and has now reopened, and it's reopened bigger. It's reopened now with more programmes being involved in it, and that's a demonstration of the resilience that often emerges from people who are attacked 
uh, and their places of worship are attacked. Uh, and so we need to very much, as a government, uh, stand very clearly beside those people who get attacked in this way and say to them that you have our support uh, to continue and to hold on to the values that you believe in. I call Joanne Dobson for a quick question thank, and then thank a quick you, answer Speaker. from the Minister. The Minister will be aware, as he travelled to Bambridge on Saturday, that the town stepped onto the world stage this weekend as our hockey club expertly hosted the European Hockey League Round I 1. I did say a quick question. Historic performance from the Bambridge boys. Can the Minister outline his support he is providing to hockey clubs to enable them to continue to attract world stage events like this to Northern Ireland? It was a pleasure to be there on Saturday morning at Banbridge. Um, I recently was at Banbridge Hockey Club when um, David Simpson and Carla Lockhart and Sydney had me there, and uh, the club were able to outline to me their facilities. And then I got to go on Saturday, uh, where they were hosting the European Hockey League, which, for members that wouldn't be familiar, it's the equivalent of football's Champions League. These were the elite uh, sports people uh, engaged in hockey, uh, and Banbridge had a tremendous result. Um, and they were supported very strongly by the local community. Uh, but just to put it into context, on the Friday, the viewing audience for those matches were over 12 million people who tuned in online to watch. So this was a very significant, uh, 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 this was a very significant event uh, for hockey to be able to host, and Banbridge uh, hosted it exceptionally well. And as a result of that, uh, £5,000 has been provided as well to help in terms of the legacy of that uh, competition, so that. Uh, people can buy into the success that it was, and hopefully more younger people uh, will take up the sport. Time is up. Members, we now return to the debate on the reclassification of housing associations. I call the Minister, Paul Given, to respond to the debate, and the Minister has 15 minutes.